Hello overclockers. Back in December 2022, I brought to you the results for my overclocking and testing of the flagship RDNA 3 card, the 7900XTX. And although it's taken AMD a bit longer to get out its entire stack of RDNA 3 cards, at last we've got the final one. This one, the 7800XT. And what I'm gonna do, be doing in this video is testing the 7800XT uh, in everything that I normally run, so benchmarks, not games for you geeks. And what we're gonna be testing is the temperatures of the card under load, the overclocking potential, and the overall performance. So, watch the rest of the video, mainly for me, but also for a bit about the graphics card. Let's get into it. Okay, firstly, a little bit about the 7800 XT by AMD. The one I'm testing for this entire review is the 7800 XT Sapphire Pure Edition that we have uh, on the desk here next to me. AMD uh, lists this GPU as having a 2430 MHz stock boost clock. But in fact, our card here boosted even at stock to 2582 MHz consistently through a, a range of quite heavy benchmarks. The card has 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, uh, and AMD lists that this boosts up to 24,030 megahertz. Our card here uh, boosted to an average of 2425 megahertz, so very, very close to the stock listing, or certainly within the margin of error for the monitoring software. This card, uh, in terms of architecture, has 60 uh, compute units, 60 ray accelerators and 120 AI accelerators. AMD in their marketing claims it's a mid-stroke high-end GPU ideal for playing the latest titles at 1440p with maximal graphic settings and that's obviously what we're going to check out a little bit of in this review. The connections on the back uh, it's got DisplayPort 2.1 and HDMI 2.1 and of course it uses FSR 3 technology which is designed to compete with NVIDIA's DLSS for huge performance in supported games. So the testing on this GPU was done on my usual GPU testing system, and that's an AMD 7950X CPU, uh, boosting up to six gigahertz with PBO2 tuning. That's on a 360mm AIO cooler on an Asus flagship Crosshair motherboard. Within the system, we've got 6,000 megahertz of DDR5, which is Corsair by manufacture and set to the XPO for the memory. So it's fairly low latency stuff. We've also got Western Digital NVMe drive with Windows 11 and all the latest updates, including chipsets and drivers. As for the graphics driver I used for this test, it was the one provided uh, by AMD for the press release of this specific card. Obviously, uh, while running the test, I had all my usual monitoring software open to check the temperature of the card, uh, the average and highest and lowest boost clocks, uh, temperature of hotspots, and all those uh, useful informations that can make us be able to draw concrete and solid conclusions about the card. Okay, now let's talk about the cooling of the card and a little bit about the cooler design. So, obviously, uh, this card is white, but of course, there's many available in black, and this, of course, aesthetically would match a white or monochrome system. The cooler itself is, as you can see here, approximately 2.5 slots in width, and it's then full length with a triple fan design. Uh, it's also got um, a white back plate that's also designed, obviously, to slick away heat from the back of the PCB and stop any kind of uh, flexing or bending that might cause damage at the back of the card. And all in all, I actually quite like the look of this card, uh, and I certainly also like the performance, which we'll move on to now. Now, in terms of performance, through all the benchmark testing I was running even overclocked, the cooler was uh, very quiet and certainly no noisier at all than the fans uh, running on the AIO, which I was using three 2200 RPM EK fans uh, on the EK AIO, and those were probably running 
between 1200 and 1400 RPM to give you guys a, you know, a kind of insight into the noise that would be coming. So not a lot of noise at all from the entire system, no matter what uh, testing I was running. And at the same time, throughout those tests, the maximum temperature I saw on the GPU was uh, 59 degrees C, uh, and the maximum temperature I saw on the hotspot was 84 degrees C. Now, obviously these are absolutely great temperatures for our DNA3, uh, and they're between 10 and even 20 degrees cooler uh, than the 7900 XTX when I performed a similar uh, degree of testing or a similar degree of workloads. Obviously, uh, this cooler I, I really like because I'm really into the monochrome design. Not always white, but it will fit in to any mo monochrome style system. Uh, and there's not too much uh, RGB or lighting on there, which really fits with my ethos. So now we've covered cooling on the individual card, let's talk a little bit about the power requirements. Uh, the typical board power uh, on this particular GPU as quoted uh, by AMD is 263 watts. They're recommending a minimum of a 700 watt PSU. Now I have to say obviously I was using a 1200 watt PSU uh, for this so way above minimum and I didn't even try you know, anything close to 700 watts. So I can't confirm whether that's the correct PSU to be using, although I can suggest that given the spec of the card and the minimum stroke maximum power requirements of the card, 700 watts to run the entire system should be more than uh, adequate. And I'm sure AMD have done their own testing on that before making recommendations. As far as the PSU goes on this one, you do not need an ATX 3.0 PSU and you do not need one with a 16 pin connector. What you do need is two uh, PCI Express, standard PCI Express that is, eight pin connectors to connect to the card and feed it with the, the correct amount of power that it does need to reach its maximum boost clocks. For all you people out there, which you're usually asking in the comments, the really annoying question, what did you do with undervolting? Because obviously it's not eight packs ethos to start slowing things down, lowering things, you know, this kind of nonsense. But for, for all you people who are conscious of your electricity bill, I did uh, try the undervolting setting within the driver, uh, and I can report that the results were slightly better in terms of performance by undervolting. Uh, you're, you're looking, and when I say slightly, I do mean slightly, it was probably like 1.5 to 1.7% throughout the benchmarks, marking sweep by using the inbuilt built undervolting, you know, within the drive, in, inbuilt undervolting setting within dr the driver. It gave this 1.5% uh, improvement, but interestingly, it didn't really change the maximum load temperatures on either the GPU itself or the hotspot. But what I did notice was a slight improvement on uh, the overall boost clock throughout the duration of the benchmark. So it wasn't really boosting that much higher as a maximum boost, but uh, under load, the average boost was certainly slightly higher, giving you this 1.5 or so percent increase. So I guess it, it is free performance. Um, so it might be worth you uh, trying it out. In terms of undervolting using uh, the driver setting before, if you remember when they tested the 79, 100 XTX, I found that undervolting, rage mode and overvolting, etc., stroke overclocking within the driver were not working at all and it wasn't stable. It couldn't pass my uh, Port Royal stability tests and other stability tests, which I deem uh, as satisfactory to use it in that state for gamers. Whereas this, every single mode that I tried as auto modes within the driver, so auto overclocking, auto undervolting, these kind of things, were working in this driver on this card. So that's a thumbs up to AMD for fixing the things. Okay, let's get round now to some stock testing. And for stock testing, I use the system that I outlined previously. And what I found uh, in my stock testing are results that are on the screen now. And to summarize these results, uh, my opinion is really that this is a great card in terms of uh, price to performance. And the results do substantiate AMD's claim that this card can run really solidly 1440p at max stroke high settings which is a good amount of kudos to AMD. What I generally found was that this card is better than the competition in most areas, apart from uh, ray tracing, where it's still lacking slightly behind. But I guess at this end of the market, not many people are really trying to max out ray tracing anyway. Uh, and they're looking to get uh, the maximum effects without this. 
I guess what we can also say uh, about this card is it's already up there with the previous 6800 XT uh, with a current driver and I'm sure it'll improve with the uh, driver revisions as AMD tends to uh, and of course the potential is much higher in this card with it being uh, the more efficient RDNA 3 architecture. Right, now we've covered boring stock bit and the even more boring undervolting bit, let's look at some overclocking results. Okay, for overclocking, uh, I firstly decided to test the inbuilt driver overclocking feature. So that's basically a one click overclocking, just click overclock core. Uh, and what happened was obviously the driver tested the card quickly and it came out with a 2670 megahertz maximum boost clock uh, overclock, which I then tested uh, by running my usual stability test. So Port Royal absolutely maxed out uh, for 20 loops, which is a 3D Mark uh, stress test. So I first checked that it was stable and I can report that driver overclocking uh, was stable and then I ran it through my uh, entire benchmark suite. So the entire benchmark suite uh, for this automatic driver overclock uh, showed around a 1.8% increase in overall performance across the entire uh, set of benchmarks at an average. Obviously some improved more than 1.8% and some a little bit less. Uh, the only issue I suppose I had with this is it was a cost of 5 degrees C in terms of temperature, but that 5 degrees C uh, certainly didn't uh, you know, result in anything in terms of stability and the cooler was more than able to handle this. You were still only getting uh, you know, early 60s uh, peak temperatures. So the auto overclocking mode is working. The Overclock was uh, 2670 megahertz, which is a very high clock for this particular card. Uh, a good solid 9 to 10% over the, the stock clock, but that only translated into 1.8% uh, in terms of benchmark results. So for manual overclocking the card, I maxed out the power slider for the power target. I then uh, set the on the manual overclocking uh, scale for the core, I set 100% for minimum and 120% for maximum. Now 120% for maximum, I could go a little bit higher, but it wasn't really affecting the results and it was affecting stability slightly. So I stuck at 120% uh, and I also added 5% to the memory. So the memory slider I set to 105% and then I ran, of course, the stability test to check everything uh, and making sure it's all stable for gaming and then I ran through my entire suite of benchmarks again. Now this time, uh, with this type of overclocking, we saw that the actual maximum overclock uh, for the peak frequency was about 5 or 10 megahertz less than the auto overclock on the driver. However, because uh, you'd set all the variables manually, it was maintaining the core frequency higher for longer, and hence you got far better results. And with manual overclocking, you also had lower temperatures besides these results. So what were the results, in fact? Well, on average, it was a 5% improvement across the entire suite of benchmarks, which is a great amount of free performance. On some benchmarks, we were seeing a 6% plus in increase, which is absolutely fabulous. Those results, I guess, in headline, uh, you would say that uh, Firestrike, which is a 1080p result, was 4.5% better. Time of Pay Extreme, which is a 4K result, was 5.6% uh, better. 1440p Time Spy was 5.4% increase. Port Royal at 4K, which actually includes quite a lot of ray tracing, uh, was 4.4% increase. Port Royal at 1440p, also a 4.4% increase. Unigen uh, superposition OC with uh, 4K optimized showed a 5.3% increase. Uh, at 1080p, this was 3.6%. Uh, Valley at 1080p had a 4.3% increase over stock. Final Fantasy, a gaming benchmark, had 4.2% increase at uh, 1440p. And Final Fantasy at 4K with high quality settings had a 9.7% increase over stock. So some of these benchmarks really do show absolute promise, especially the Final Fantasy 4K uh, with high quality. Uh, that's a really, really impressive gain uh, for overclocking, almost 10% uh, of free performance. And what I suggest is, as the benchmarks move up resolution, uh, as usual, they're shifting the bottleneck within the system from the CPU and the memory more to the GPU. And this RDNA 3 architecture is still, uh, you know, a very efficient high-end architecture and does need powerful uh, CPU 
and very high resolutions to shift the benchmarking emphasis to the GPU itself, which we have seen that in the 4K results, which gain actually almost all uh, over 5% from our manual overclock. And really, that's all I've got to say about the overclocking. Not only was it, you know, 4K, it well over 5% increase. Uh, it also, because you can tune the voltage and tweak these settings as well, ran cooler, the fans uh, ran at a lower RPM, uh, and everything for, uh, you know, and obviously power draw as well has to be less for, uh, you know, free performance. So again, well done to AMD for this. Okay, so what are my final conclusions about this card? I think this card is great in terms of price to performance and it's really, really pushing uh, the limits of what you get in the mid-tier uh, in this respect. It's probably the best card actually in the mid-tier right now, price to performance if you're buying right now. Now obviously, if you have a 6800 XT or above from previous generations, this card's probably not for you because it's not offering you quite as much bang for buck to, to worth spending uh, you know on a brand new card but if you're on anything of older generations then it's certainly uh, worth a look or if you've been waiting to upgrade for a while it does fulfill the 1440p high to max settings area of the market pretty well obviously also going for this card is that it doesn't need an atx 3.0 psu and it doesn't need a 16 pin connector and it's not pushing uh, really high spikes in voltage either uh, this particular model that we've got here, the Sapphire Pure model, uh, I've only really got good things to say about it. The cooler design is great, it keeps the card uh, very nice and cool. It's not uh, loud at all, it's really, uh, you know, was totally unobtrusive uh, throughout my testing in terms of noise levels. And also the design in an all white or a monochrome system would uh, really match well. Uh, and also the fact as usual that it's not got too much light in our RGB, which is not uh, to my personal taste. Obviously, if you want to purchase one of these cards or look into them further, please do check out the links uh, at the bottom of this video, uh, which will take you to the Overclockers website uh, for further information. This card uh, I am going to be carrying along uh, with me to the uh, Insomnia Gaming Festival over the weekend. So if you want to check out the card in person, or indeed there are several of my 8-pack systems, and obviously the highlight of the festival itself, I'll be there to uh, show it to you and to have a bit of a chat. Finally, and of course, do not uh, like the video, do not subscribe to the channel, do not uh, bother subscribing to our socials either, but do check out my biceps. And of course, squat hard for the next month. <laughs>